Well, I would like to restart if you don't mind. Please. Okay, so in this hour, we're going to do a thing that we never did. So it can work very well, very badly, or something in the middle. Uh, that is giving you a more detailed perspective on what the projects entail until the end of the course. This is because also some students past year asked for these at the beginning of the course uh, and I can understand why um, but still let me add a disclaimer at the beginning of this so this is for some part a preview of something that will happen in December and we are in September so take it with a uh, little bit of grain and especially as we we're saying before to some of you um, focus on one assignment at a time don't rush things don't today think or what you are going to do in December because December is far away from here and you will have a knowledge and information that you don't have here now because the course is 60 hours and we you, we are going to use them and so you don't have in this four hour and a half all the information you need to arrive at the end of the course otherwise the course will be over today no so take it slowly trust us a little bit that we know what we are doing and trust also a little bit the process that we are going through. We do this course since 2019. It changed a little bit in 2022, but still, we, it's not the first year. So we know where we are heading to. And so please have a little bit of trust in us. Having said that, this is for many parts a preview. And I will also bring here two examples of projects of past years and their main outcomes as an example, to give you a concrete example, uh, what you're going to see is not exactly what you are going to do and is not the entire work they did. It's just something to give you an, an idea, a concrete idea in a slide format. Okay? So let's start talking about project development. This is a recap from the course introduction, so or things you've already seen. So the goal of project development is to give you hands-on experience, practical experience. With the human-centered design process we have seen yesterday and a little bit before, that will be described during the course, step by step, and you will follow along during the course with assignment. Uh, assignment will be carried during the lab, and as I was saying in the first lecture, um, the assignment will start during the lab in two cases they will be followed by checks feedback without a score without a grade for you to refine things improve things before moving to the next step uh, this is about the group assignment the evaluation of the project will happen at the exam we will give you feedback the feedback could be very good very bad something in the middle doesn't matter you take the feedback and you can try to improve it before moving on so that at the exam you have the best version possible of that assignment done for the evaluation. So the feedback is really there for you to help you do a better job in the process and hopefully get a better score at the end. Hmm? Uh, we will not remember the feedback, absolutely. You are too many to remember what we said in a specific moment, a specific group, in September when the exam is in February or in July. 
Hmm? So this is something already said, um, but should be, I prefer to repeat it. The project topic, each team will create a project developed during the course within a specific team that are the three teams we already covered. And the start of it will be need findings, the things we started to say today. So if you came to me or the other two teachers and say, we thought to do a project on a platform slash app slash system slash interface slash whatever else, the answer is you are doing it wrong because that's a solution. We want to understand the problems that stem in a domain. So don't came to us saying we want to do this. We want to do this will happen in one month. So in one month, you can come to us and say, I want to do this. And we'll say, good, do or not or suggestions, but not now. Hmm? So assignment two will be, we want to do this. Assignment one is we want to explore a domain understand what are issues, what are problems, to extract needs to build solutions. Uh, just a reminder, we have five assignments. One is individual. So assignment one is just about need finding. The methods we started to see today, the things you started to, to learn today about selecting users, etc. At the end of assignment one, you will come up with these needs are the ones we select to build a solution. And at the very end of assignment one, you will say the solution is X, the platform, the app, the whatever. And assignment two, storyboard and low fidelity prototype, you will analyze the solution, describe it better, and start designing a prototype of that solution. We will actually ask you two prototypes that solve the same solution, two different prototypes on different devices, with different input mechanism, different prototypes. And you will see all the detail in the text of assignment two. Assignment three, and after assignment one, and after assignment two, there will be a feedback session. So whatever you did, you will have time to fix it. If it's not perfect, improve it, or partially, hopefully, redo it. And this assignment needs to be worked on during the labs hour so that when you, for instance, create something for the low fidelity prototype, that something is already discussed with the teacher. So you have pre-checks during the evaluation, during the labs. That's why I was saying that labs are not, here is the text, do the work, ask question, buy. But our, here is the text, start thinking, and then we can talk about it. And then you can work a little bit more, and then we can talk about it, etc., etc., etc and then buy, but that's at the end. Assignment three is the individual heuristic evaluation, and it's an evaluation, as I was saying, individual for another group low prototype, low fidelity prototype. Assignment four is a bridge that brings you from the low fidelity prototype that will be on paper and pen, literally, to the high fidelity prototype in step four, in assignment five. And Assignment five is the high fidelity prototype and its evaluation. And the high fidelity prototype will be in code since you are in a computer engineer degree. So this is the same diagram I already showed you a little bit before and yesterday without labels in the arrows actually. Now I'm going to show you how the assignment map with these um, process and what we're going to do during the course. So the first thing we are going to ask you at the beginning of assignment one is choosing a domain within the team because the team is large. Ultra one being means everything and the contrary of everything. So what each team needs to do is to specialize that team a little bit in what we call domain. Okay, so I don't want to use an example from the actual team. So let me use the same example I used before. If the team is transportation, the domain could be commuting between home and work. That's a specialization of the general team. 
still around transportation, but specify who are the users, who are the activities you can then do need finding on. That's the first thing. With that defined, you will prepare need finding. Hmm? What is needed? Need finding assignment one. And you will conclude assignment one with this solution I was saying, and you will move in, ass in uh, assignment two. Assignment two will ask you two things. One is the storyboard. That is our way that we will see during the class for doing the analysis of the results. And will also consist in the design and creation of a low fidelity prototype that we will see during the class before the release of assignment two. So we start this loop. Then assignment three is the heuristic evaluation. So you evaluate another group prototype to give them feedback on how to improve it for the next iteration of the prototype. That will be assignment four, that I was saying was a bridge. Assignment four is something that you start from the risk evaluation. You do a little bit of analysis on the results of evaluation that you receive from multiple evaluators and you design something and you plan something to proceed with the next iteration of the loop. And then the final, the high fidelity prototype will start from what you decided in the cycles before and will create a high fidelity prototype in code. Most of the decision, most of the design decision should be already done by the previous cycle and the AF, the low fidelity and the medium fidelity prototype. And then you will conduct a usability testing at the very end, just before the exam, on that high fidelity prototype. And that is part of assignment five. And this ends the project of the course. We will never go out of this cycle, this loop. We will never reach the implement and deploy the final products because we are stopping at the prototyping level we are not going to do the final product here. But you from the high fidelity prototype, you can iterate, hypothetically, can iterate a little bit more, can start working on the final, prod, the final product, etc. but we will work in prototypes. So we will, and we will never cross, we will never cross this line. So implement and deploy is something we will not do in the course. We will stop at prototyping phase. Usability testing on the prototype. You get feedback, you tell us how you can improve it, the high fidelity prototype, as if you will continue, but you will not, you will stop. Because it's sixth grade course, it's not 60, and so at a certain point we, we need to stop it and give you time to understand and do things in a proper way with the right amount of time. Uh, just for your information, two years ago, we did an additional cycle with a medium fidelity prototype that we removed because it was too much work. And that bridge stemmed from that missing iteration. Hmm? The normal iteration would have been all cycle on low fidelity, cycle on medium fidelity, and cycle on high fidelity. We just remove the medium fidelity and keep it just a little bit as a way to respond to the results of the heuristic evaluation before moving to the high fidelity prototype. And again, we will see what is a low fidelity prototype, which are the characteristics, how it's made, how you can make it, what is a medium fidelity prototype, which tool can use for the medium fidelity prototype, etc. And we will do the same for the high fidelity prototype. And as was saying before to some of you, uh, there will be a lecture in which I will ask group by group which is your prototype about for the high fidelity and we work together options of technology to use in that prototype. Hmm? We did it last year, it worked quite well and we can redo it with specific issues that each group can, can then have. Again, the project completion level is an high fidelity interactive prototype in code. We don't care about the technology. It should be done in code. The groups knows JavaScript, do it in JavaScript. 
the groups know React Native, go with it. The groups want to do it in Unity, if it's fit for the project, fine. We don't care about the specific technology that you use. We are not going to look in details to the code quality you produce, because this is not the goal of this course. And because it is a prototype, it's not a product. So, of course, requirements are different. So, should be in code, that's for sure. Uh, should have some persistency layer, for reasons that you will understand later. Uh, and can be with any technology you like, know, and it's fit, of course, for your project. Hmm? You cannot use virtual reality technology to do a desktop web application, of course, because it doesn't make sense. You can do vice versa, however. Again, not a final product and will simulate, since it's a prototype, a realistic experience on a specific device that you will, at a certain point, define and decide on. Uh, since it's a prototype, for example, you can use web technology to build a prototype that looks like and behave as a mobile application. So you decide to do that your project should be a mobile application, but you don't know any mobile technology, but you know web technology, you can use web technology, HTML, CSS, whatever framework you know, if any, Express, if you want to say web application technology, SQLite, JavaScript or TypeScript, whatever, and make an application, a web application that will run in the browser but we run in a browser on a smartphone, and so it will look like and behaves like a mobile application. And so the navigation bar will be, for instance, at the bottom as any, as many mobile applications. So we'll respect the behaviors and the appearance of mobile application while being doing as a web application. That's totally possible because, and I will promise I will not repeat it anymore, it's a prototype. So you want to make a point, you want to demonstrate a point, and this is a way to demonstrate a point. Hmm? Any questions so far? Or just chatting individually? Okay. So the other thing is that the prototype will make some assumption and it won't implement standard or very complex feature. I just mentioned this yesterday, even if they're technically important. So these assumptions, these not things not implemented, it can be faked, limited in number, or are coded. For instance, your user, you will not have a sign in and sign up procedure. Because it's not unless you are doing a project or a brand new novel way of logging in people as an application, as a project you don't need them. You don't need to waste time doing a standard screen with two labels and a button. You don't need them. You will need users logged in. Good, you start with user logged in. You just keep all the process, all the implementation for realizing the logged in, the login, and you will start with a user that's logged in. There is the name in the top corner of the page and you can click it and see the profile and the profile will be predefined by you, limited, hard-coded information. Uh, and any particular behavior will work in a small number of predefined cases. You want, uh, we had a project a couple of years ago that wanted to help support users to uh, build IKEA furniture in a better way. Um, they didn't implement all the IKEA catalog. They just implement three things like a chair, a table, just for demonstration and a prototype purposes. They make the point with these three examples. Complete example, you can build a table, that's it, but you can build that table. If you look for a sofa, there is no sofa because the catalog is not there. It doesn't make sense to put all the information in a prototype. But two or three information, essential information, in that case related to the IKEA building stuff that were needed. So, small number of predefined case. So, let me make two examples uh, of two projects with their team uh, from the last two years. Again, this is a preview of what they did. And 
there are many details, many things we ask them and we'll ask you that are not reported here, just the main information. So as you will need to do, they need to choose a team. So in 2022, my team was augmented reality, virtual reality for education. Mm? So all projects need to do something about education and at a certain point add something in 3D virtual reality or augmented reality. That was a constraint related to education. So they pick up a domain as a specialization of the team and their domain was supporting elementary school teacher to teach math. There is no augmented reality here. There is no virtual reality. It's just a domain within education. And this is something you will need to do as well if you pick topic number two or three. Focus on the educational part, on the exploring part, and not on the other parts. So that was their domain. They did need finding. They extracted needs that I'm not reporting here. Uh, also because in that year we did two cycles of need finding. Um, and the solution they picked at the end of need finding, after extracting the needs, etc., was this one. Allowing teacher to create more engaging and better explaining scenario to represent the math problem they want to tackle in the class and the logic behind them. Hmm? So primary school. Children learning to do basic mathematical operation. Teachers need a way to make this learning more engaging for the age of the scholars and not just drawing things on a um, blackboard or on any board. Okay? So they did need finding, they struck the need that teacher would need to create to have more personalization, more control in a way that is more engaging, to create experience more engaging. Notice one thing in the solution. It doesn't, and also yours won't, specify any technology. It doesn't say it's an app. It doesn't say what are the features. It say which is the goal of the system. The system is something that will allow teacher to create a scenario to represent mathematical problem and logic in a way that is engaging for the students, the young students. Hmm? That's the solution. It's not a technical solution, it's not feature. You can, you can imagine many features here. You can do it in multiple ways. How they did it? They created two paper prototypes because we asked them to create two paper prototypes. One is this one. So they imagine a, tab a tablet with augmented reality. Here there is augmented reality, of course, uh, in which they create this scenario with objects and you can drag and drop and create this object in the real world. And this is a paper prototype, no colors, and made exactly as the paper prototype you will do. Something you can do with kindergarten skills in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, more or less. Okay? And then this is the second prototype. In the second prototype, they will, they uh, keep, kept some elements from the first one and they focus more on quiz. So questions, right answers, and a little bit more gaming in the application. The big solution came after the need. Yeah, but didn't the need for the teacher something to better explain? The yes. In assignment one, you will do some need finding methods, and then you will extract between 10 and 15 needs. And then from these 10 and 15 needs, you will need to extract three or four that are really deep needs among maybe many teachers they talk to. And between these three or four, you need to brainstorm solutions linked to that, and this was one solution linked to one of these deep need. Then, of course, there is a strong link between the solution and the need. And what was the, the actual need? Like, is it the teacher what did the I don't remember. I think that they need a way to, um, to explain math problem in a more engaging way. So it's very similar to the solution. But it came, the solution came after the need, okay? 
So here, in the middle, there is a lot of work. In their case, three weeks of work. In your case, two. So two prototypes. Um, then the prototype were evaluated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the next skipped here. The next step is the medium fidelity prototype that we skip here, but it's just a medium fidelity prototype, still black and white. And this is the high fidelity prototype they created. So it's sort of they pick the first paper prototype to continue according to the results evaluation. This is something you will also do. You will create two prototypes and according to results evaluation, you will decide whether to continue with one, with another, with bringing pieces from the first and put in the second and vice versa. You will decide after the evaluation. And then they did the medium fidelity and this is the high fidelity prototype they created. It resembles the paper prototype. It clearly is colorful, is in 3D and is, it does augmented reality for sure. And it was done with uh, web-based technology uh, on, uh, I think, in, with a React Native. And here you see the augmented reality part because that the, the things, the, the laptop and the table are in the real world. But they had to use augmented reality and virtual reality in the team. So all projects in that topic use this kind of technology. Then I have to admit, this is one of the best projects we had in two years. So it's a high standard and high reference, but still, um, it's a good example because it's, it's done so well. This prototype had limitations, the R-coded part, the limited number part. Uh, so these are the main limitations. There was the minor min limitation. Uh, there is no pinch to zoom. You cannot zoom with a normal gesture. Uh, objects are always put at the center of the scene. If you already have some, an object at the center, you will have another object on top, uh, overlap with it. Hmm? Uh, Objects don't respond to the law of physics. They stay there. They don't fall, and if they fall, they fall randomly. Hmm? Uh, and objects are, are coded in a JavaScript file, meaning that they had like three objects, the giraffe, the apple, and probably another thing, and you can change the color of the apple. That's it. Mm, three objects, one action on one of them. Of course, this could be extended to support multiple objects, many more. But it's a prototype, it makes a point. That this kind of operation, so you can put four apples and you count up, up to four. And then what happens if I remove one apple? Well, three is the number. So it's allow people to do mathematical operation with children in class. That was the idea, the things they wanted to prove that it's possible to make it a more engaging mathematical explanation. And they did it in this way, starting from the finding. OK? Project number one, um, 2022. Project number two. Last year, different team. Uh, last year, the third team was uh, human AI interaction. So huge team. It doesn't say specifically health, well-being, education, could be whatever. But the constraint here, similarly to the virtual reality part, is that at a certain point there should be interaction with an AI, which is in some way similar to the third topic of this year. But the third topic of this year is specified on education, not in general. So this group um, chosen as a domain, urban tourism, national and international. Um, they also write it in a longer way, but this is for space purposes, this is enough. So that is the domain that they choose within the huge team. Again, no AI is involved at this stage, as it should be. They did the finding, they extract 15 teams, they extract three deep teams, the three deep needs from them, they brainstorm 15 different solutions, and they pick one top solution that was a survey to understand the user preference and create the itinerary accordingly. 
again, I don't remember exactly what was the need. I can imagine, uh, also because it's not my team, so uh, different from the previous one. Um, I imagine it was something to create itinerary of visit in the city personalized to the uh, to what the person wanted to see, do, experience, how many times it was already in that city, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, national and international, so it should apply everywhere. It's not just about Turin, it should be everywhere. Uh, and this was the top solution that they pick up after talking with people, doing urban tourism, visiting cities, etc. As before, two prototypes, the first Low fidelity prototype was um, um, end made as before, black and white, a uh, mobile application prototype. And the second one was a desktop application prototype. And they motivated why, of course, they picked these two. Here, they started to think where AI could fit in in the process. And as you can imagine, since this needs to be creating itinerary the AI is on the creation, personalization of the itinerary. Hmm? Um, two paper prototypes, they did the heuristic evaluation, they get feedback and they decided to continue with this prototype for a reason uh, that I think was that people, this was more useful in planning and people plan is more difficult to do in a, on a mobile phone, it's easier to do on a big screen, plan the trip. Uh, and this is the high fidelity prototype. So this is more um, less impactful with respect to the previous one. It's a, um, a web application um, in which you can fill in some preferences and then you obtain an itinerary that is intelligently created for you. Except uh, this intelligence is not real, it's simulated, which means limitations the absence of a sophisticated ai driving the trip generation which means that if you insert some information you get a trip if you insert a slightly different information you get a trip you have three four cases and outside of these three four cases it doesn't work it gives you the same information so there is not a real ai within and there is a reliance on a chatbot for edits here they put the chatbots you can click it, and if you want to edit the itinerary you created, like, I don't want to see this museum, or it's going to rain that day, so let's not do it in a park, or and let's move it inside, that the um, chatbot for. And also the chatbot is limited, as it only accepts a, a few specific input sentence for trip modification, and disregard everything else. It understand four, five, six specific sentence, and then everything else is not understandable. It's like, if the person say this, then do that. Else, if the person say this, then do that. It's not real artificial intelligence, it's more logic, hmm? embedded logic, that appears to be, to behave like artificial intelligence. Hmm? We had then another project uh, I think two years ago, where they had the same team. Um, we keep this team for two years, and then we changed this year, uh, in which they wanted to add some artificial intelligence coming from the AI background. And so they added real AI models within, but this was extra in a way, not required. Uh, it was more realistic, but not necessarily more, as a prototype, more high fidelity than this one with specific reasons. And the high fidelity prototype, this one and the other one, needs to be tested with real users. So in this case, with uh, travelers. In the other case, with teachers of a primary school, math teacher of our primary school. But that test is still guided by you. You will tell, you have to do this. So there is no possibility for them to create, for instance, a trip that is not available or to put an object on the screen that is not a an apple and a giraffe because the, ta the the indication you will give is you want to create a scenario for counting apples and then they will put apples on the screen hmm? 
And the goal of this test is to understand the usability of the application. Hmm? So it's still guided. That's why you can uh, restrict the, um, the behaviors. But still, it looks right. It looks real. It looks like a product, something you can use it. Hmm? Except it's not. It's partially with fake information, with fake behavior, with R coded thing. Hmm? And again, this is a preview of what we are, you are going to do, but we will cover all of these, and there will be also the text of assignment five that will explain again all of this. So right now, as we were saying before, don't focus much on this, but focus on this. On picking a domain and preparing need finding. Uh, ignoring, if you pick topic number three, the AI, and ignoring, if you pick topic number two, the playful. Keep it in mind that at a certain point there will need to be some AI-like behavior and some playfulness in the solution. But right now, you are, don't want to understand if they will use AI. You want to understand your specific domain first. Hmm? That in this case was urban tourism, in the other case was a math teacher in primary school during the class activity. Okay, so this is what's going to happen until December and until the exam actually because the high fidelity prototype and the usability testing need to be done seven days before the exam that you want to do. So it's way, it will be January for some, it will be February for some, it will be July for others, it will be September for others. So according to the team preferences, for the team preference, the group preference, you can arrange less or more time without differences. Okay, any question on this part? Is it clearer how the process will unfold until the end of the course? Yes, no, maybe. Yes. Okay. So let me spend a couple of words on this year topic. Here, this is exactly the same slide that you have in the introduction course, so let me not read it again. But the first theme is Earth Wellbeing. Uh, it will be Wednesday, 1 p.m., this room, with hopefully one-third of you. Uh, and it's about Earth Wellbeing. So there is a description that gives you an idea what is about the theme, but just by the from the title you should imagine what's about. So a couple of perspectives that I agree with Alberto are these. So if you are interested in topic number one, keep an eye on the perspective and think about it already. Uh, so you know you want to, we will ask you, and again, I will put online the text of assignment number one later today or tomorrow, so you can start reading it, and we can discuss it on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, but you know you will need to find a domain that specializes your topic. So if you pick topic number one, which earth or well-being related topics, domain, you want to explore? It's more physical health, it's more diseases, it's more psychological well-being, it's more emotional well-being, it's stress management, and for whom? For students, for young adults, for children, for the elderly, for groups, for individuals. What do you want to do? And for whom? And another question, are we able, are you able to reach out to these people? Because you need to talk with them, to do something with them, and then to involve them in the usability testing in the end. So if you get, again, astronauts, unless you know, or F1 pilots, unless you know F1 pilots, it's hard for you to, to reach them. So you will need to, to know a few people, a few of them, two, three people in your category that you pick up. So try to be, try not to focus on the classical example in health and well-being and also in education last year, that was my topic, was student at the gym. That's, yes, it's health, and, but it's also very, very easy for you, right? Because students, how many of you go to the gym?
So you have friends that go to gym, so that's very, very easy to, to reach out. So maybe not that easy, but maybe don't get F1 pilots either. Something in the middle should work well. Hmm? Uh, keep in mind, related to the, this, that creativity and originality are criteria for devaluation. So as an example, LP student attending a local gym alone is of course less original and creative and effortless than supporting the same students actually in using their smartphone mindfully and effectively managing their digital habits. Hmm? That is a little bit more challenging as a thing than let's look how people get ripped in the gym and how can we can help them for health or well-being reasons. Okay? Any question on team one? Because we're moving team two. Team two, uh, playful exploration of the world, this room, this hour. I'm not reading the description, but the idea is still is large enough to include various domains, various subtopics about exploration of the city, of a building, of a country, of a park, of something. You get around or your neighborhood for touristic reasons or for practical reasons. Like I want to, I'm just moved to a new city. And so imagine when you move for the first time, if you're not of touring, you move here from the first time, there, there will be something you explored. Hmm? Also for really practical reasons, like where is the supermarket? Where is the bus stop? How do I go to Polytechnico? Hmm? There was exploration inside Polytechnico. So that is all possibility for exploration. As before, perspective, three questions for you, very similar to, to the previous one. Uh, which aspects of exploring the world do you want to focus on? And at which scale? City, neighborhood, building, country, parks, cities in general, etc. Museum, monuments, supermarkets, bus stops. Uh, at which scale? And then for whom? And for which activities? For students, for older adults, for young adults, for children for families, for casual tourist, tourists, for whom? And again, are we able to reach out to these people? So two years ago, we had a project about the museum. And so the group went in front of the Egyptian Museum in Turin and stopped people just uh, going outside of the museum to do the unit funding phase. And it worked. They need a little bit of, you need a little bit of courage to do something like that but typically people is kind if you ask them. Another year we had someone um, wanted to do something for shops, uh, for dress shops, and so they went to shops at uh, Lingotto and they had mixed reaction there. Some people say, no, no, I'm working, I don't care. Some other shops were more open to, to talk with them. Again, a little bit of courage. It's again, more difficult to do this than not just reach out to students or your peers. Um, here, as in topic number three, playfulness will need to be included for assignment two, not before. So right now, don't focus on playfulness. Just keep it in the back of your mind so that in the solution you imagine or in the things you see, you can imagine if there is some level of playfulness that can come in for the solution. And again, creativity and originality are also in this case criteria. So helping students exploring Polytechnico is legit, is also extremely easy and uncreative at all. Um, supporting visitors navigate through the history of various monuments in a city, meaning that I see the monument and maybe I see, I see the Colosseum and I see how the Colosseum was 100 years ago, 300 years ago, etc. is another story. Hmm? Still exploration. Historical exploration of a city, but still exploration. Uh, game is gamification in brief. Uh, does any of you, I don't even know where, when the course is actually, there is a course on game design. Does any, any of you did the course or will do the course? Did the course? You did the course? Will do the course? Okay. 
So this is not to repeat what they do there, um, but just to give you a very quick two slides um, ideas on playfulness and the fact that playfulness and games and gamification are not the same thing. So the central idea elements to play in general, like children that play, and games are these three. Uh, you have dynamics, you have mechanics, and you have game components. Uh, dynamics is the central elements that define the patterns of how the game and the player evolve over time. The t means typically the story of the game, the path you are going to do in the game, the progression, you step one level from another level, that kind of things are the dynamics. Then you have the mechanics that are the specific actions that move the game forward, like collecting things to reach a level, um, challenges, side quests in more adventurous games, rewards, upgrades of the player. These are mechanics. And then the game components are the specific feature that implements the mechanics. Mm -hmm. So the leaderboards, the points, will allow you to understand if you overcome the level, if you get the rewards or not. Mm -hmm. uh, these are central elements for plays and game in general. Uh, you can imagine as a solution to do a video game, is not prohibited, um, a full video game. Um, one step lower, the full game is gamification. Gamification is the application of certain game mechanics, not dynamics, but mechanics, to provide extrinsic motivation to do something with some reward. Uh, without the dynamics of the game to create engagement. Mm -hmm. So if you use Duolingo or something, you get points to if you do many lectures, many lessons. Uh, is to create engagement, is an extrinsic motivation to keep you on the app to do the up, to, to do what the app is, is telling you to do, doing lectures, to move on. It's not a game. There is not a story. There are lectures, thing, quits to pass, etc. points to gain. This is gamification. Um, so using some mechanics, especially the one that incentivize like rewards, leaderboards, points, etc. And then there is playfulness that's a little bit more generic than the, the previous two. Uh, playfulness is, according to a philosopher that I, I don't know honestly who he is, I just pick it up on the internet, is uh, an attitude of mind. I like the definition. Is an attitude of mind. Uh, and so gamification in games are a manifestation of playfulness. But you can do something with gamification, you can play a game and be terribly bored by that game of the gamification. You can, cannot be playful while playing a game because you don't engage with the game, you hate that game, or the levels, the points doesn't make sense to you in that specific gamified approach. So playfulness uh, is a um, games and gamification are a manifestation of playfulness, but the contrary is not true always. So playfulness is more about the dynamics of the games, the story, the engagement, the path, the things you can do. Hmm? They're not specific mechanics. Uh, so the spontaneous creative experience and less on mechanics. So while gamification has a lot of mechanics and almost absent dynamics, Playfulness as dynamics and some mechanics, and typically not the mechanics that are used in gamification. So not incentives, not points, etc. So uh, playfulness can be found in humor, can be found in uh, uh, rooming around a new virtual environment, uh, or for instance in uh, challenges periodic. So side quest in a way that are mechanics, but not related to gamification, typical gamification. Uh, and it's proved that playfulness more than games and gamification increase effectiveness, motivation, and creativity of the people using the playfulness environment. So in the team, we want, in the solution, that the user can try to manifest this playfulness as much as possible, which practically means using in a good way, some game elements, some game dynamics, and some game mechanics within the um, 
the application of the solution. That would maybe mean that there is a story or there is something that happens or there is surprises somewhere, not necessarily levels or points or leaderboards or prizes to get. Okay? So this is about playfulness. Any question on this? Topic number three, education with AI in 30 minutes, not here in room 2i. Um, this is about education in general, could be formal or non-formal, so school, but also people learning to do something on their own. Um, that, again, in the solution will need AI, so, or will benefit from AI. So again, perspectives. Which kind of education and learning do you want to focus on? It's formal, non-formal, etc. At which scale? Class, school, individual, group of friends studying for an exam. All of this is education and learning. Um, for whom? Student, teachers, we have seen that application, the first application that's called the Matilo 2. Um, that could make a little bit of sense if you speak Italian. Um, was for teachers, not for students. It was an application for teachers to create scenarios for the classroom, not for students to use them. So the perspective was the teacher one. Uh, and then again, are you able to reach these people? As before, AI not needs to be included here, just for assignment two. Again, right now, keep it, keep it in the back of your mind. And as before, this is just copy and paste. Creativity and originality are criteria for evaluation, so helping polytechnic student to study better with ChatGPT is not a lot creative and original as a solution. So, as I said before, two words about playfulness, let's say two words about what change when AI is an interface. Um, so, question for you, what's different when AI is an interactive system? So, you have an app without AI, and you have the same AI app with an AI in it. What's the difference between in the interaction modality, in what you expect between the two apps? I have two slides on this and then we are over. So if you take 15 minutes to answer, we will end at four. If you answer before, we will leave before, as you wish. So what's different between an application with AI and one without? So imagine, I don't know, the Polito app without AI, like now you have, <laughs> and with AI to do something. So, but you can do also that same something without AI, in a different way, of course. So. What's the difference? What's AI brings on for human's perspective? Maybe it's not uh, deterministic the output. Without maybe. It's not deterministic the output. So AI-based systems are performed under uncertainty. So they can produce false positive, they can produce false negative, but the most important, many AI components are inconsistent. And we will see that one traditional principle of human computer interaction is that consistency is of the, of the, um, a lot of times good. We already seen one example yesterday with the Google icons that consistency is not always good, but the same colors, the same palette was a good idea. So that is consistency, but AI intrinsically is often not consistent. You can ask something and get an answer now, and then you can ask the same thing in one month and get a totally different answer in positive or negative. Uh, so they may respond differently to the same text input over time. Without thinking of ChatGPT, you can think of autocompletion. You can autocomplete Word while writing in a different way if the autocomplete system learn from you writing, then in theory, the autocompletion will be more accurate as you move on in time or behave differently from one user to another one. So search engine, Google, uh, at the moment returns different results to me than to him, than to him, slightly different, but they are different. So I cannot look something and say it's the first answer because the first results may be the third for, it, for them, for you. So 
these are inconsistent and uncertainly. So how can we deal in a user interface with um, inconsistency and this kind of uncertainty? Or how can we simulate this in inconsistent and then deal with it? Uh, well, there are three suggestions, plus two side notes. The three suggestion is that even if you have to insert AI in the application, because topic number three asks you to insert some behavior of AI at a certain point, uh, you have to decide smartly when to AI and when not. So maybe one feature makes a lot of sense in AI, and maybe another feature is a terrible idea to put it with AI, and if you choose the terrible idea, you are causing yourself trouble, and you're causing your user trouble. Uh, another thing you can, so you can decide that AI you should be included, but where and when is more important than to include it somewhere. Uh, you can also understand when and what to automate, to make automatic, and when and what can augment the user capacity. Hmm? So where AI can support you in doing something better or when AI can replace you in doing that operation. And most importantly, on a feedback side, balance the uncertainty of AI system, real or simulated, made up, with proper expectation and feedback. And on proper expectation and feedback, here there are two side notes. So if the functionality that is powered by AI is critical, the more critical it is, the more people need accurate and reliable and consistent results. Otherwise, they will classify the application as is not working. And end of the story. It could be the best things ever, but it's not working. It's not working for them. Uh, on the other hand, if complementary features if a feature or a functionality is complementary, it's not the main one, it's not critical. It's something, yes, it's nice to have, but it's not so critical. Then people are typically more forgiving for errors, for different results, etc. So if you're doing an application where AI needs to support writing, for instance, it's a critical part because it needs to support writing, and it makes a mess in writing, then people will say it doesn't work, and I'm not going to use it. But if it's a reminder that is generated by AI, or it's a question you can ask to understand better something, it's a complementary functionality, and then people in that case are more forgiving than the critical functionality. Because at worst, they will say, okay, this suggestion is not really useful. I will not use the suggestion, but will continue to use all the other critical parts of the AI. And maybe they will complain, but that's another story. Um, so these are two ideas for when you will need to uh, include AI in a simulated or realistic way along the course, especially in the implementation part, but still also in the paper prototype, you, you will need to, to think where AI can fit. If it's a critical function, it's a complementary function, and then it's made on paper, so you will always provide the right or the wrong answer because you decide. And then again, we will tell you how to do this, you decide. Uh, we plan, if everything goes well, in the calendar we had planned, how many of you, I asked on, on Telegram, but I can also ask here, how many of you do the uh, AI path in computer engineer or data science? Okay, between half and one third. Um, we plan to do, if we can, one lecture on human AI interaction, a little bit more in depth than these two slides. And again, one last thing, and then we can stop. AI, gamification, games, playfulness, while they are mandatory, in a way for topics number two, playfulness, and AI topic number three, you can decide that in topic number three, you also have a game or a gamification element or a playful element. And you can have AI in topic number one as well. It's not that 
you cannot have those things in the other topics. It's just that you have to have AI in topic number three and playfulness in topic number two. It's a constraint of these two topics, but then you are free to explore in the solutions these two things, including augmented reality, virtual reality, voice recognition, speech, whatever in the other, in the three topics. Any question on this? Okay, so if you don't have any question and this was useful and clear, it's over. Have a nice rest of the week. We will see each other on Monday.